Let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise in here tonight. Man, do you believe in the transformational power of God? Do you believe that tonight? Hey, if you believe it, somebody shout amen in here tonight. Amen. Hey, we're here. We're glad that you're here. You may be seated. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. You could be anywhere, but you chose to be here. So I want to thank you so much for being here uh, this evening. Man, are you excited to be here? Come on. Are you excited? Hand clap. Day. Do you believe that? That's why you're here. I know that's why you're here. You didn't come to hear me talk. Come on, somebody. Why, right? I hope you didn't. You came to hear the Lord. Amen. That's why we're here tonight. And the good news of Jesus. Look, we've been in a series called Available. We've been in this uh, talk called Available. And I'm 100% convinced that if we make ourselves available then God is able. If we make ourselves available, then God is able. This transformational power that we just sang about, God, transform us just by simply knowing who you are and your glory. God, transform us. That transformational power is there, but we have to make ourselves available. And as soon as we do that, God is then able. Amen. That's what this whole purpose is about. That's what this series is about, is how do we make ourselves available to a living God? How do we make ourselves available? And and, and here is the biggest question, is when we do, is God really able? Because that's the number one doubt that we all struggle with. Is God, if I surrender this and make myself available, are you really able to take it away? God, if I give you this drug or this substance or this abuse, Lord, if I make myself available to cleansing, will you really remove it, God? It's that mix between the doubt and the fear, knowing God is real, but is he real for you? It's that moment where you say, God, I I want you to come into my marriage or my relationship, but I'm going to make myself available to you, and I'm going to believe that you are able to fix it. See, we we serve an able God, but the problem is is quite often we don't make ourselves available. So tonight I want to talk about that. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. Uh, Acts chapter 9, we're going to continue in in this book of Acts. It was written by a man named Luke. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. Now, if you remember, uh, we've been talking about since the resurrection of Jesus, because without the resurrection of Jesus, none of this matters, right? I mean, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, then there's no point in us being here. I mean, am I right? Amen? Amen. Yeah, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, if none of this is real, then all of this is in vain. So today, I want to talk to you about an important message in the Bible in Acts chapter 9 after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if you remember last week, we talked about being in tune with God, what it looks like to be in tune with His Spirit, to listen to Him, to to walk with Him, and to have Him walk with us. What that looks like. Well, tonight we're going to be in uh, Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. I just want to read a quick uh, 22 verses quick 22 verses. I'm like, oh Lord, have mercy. Jesus, be with me. But we're going to read Acts chapter 9. This is the conversion of a man named Saul. And after I read this, I want to give you a little backstory. But this is what the Bible says. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them back, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. 
So he's talking about, the, and just so we clarify, follower of the way is what they called Christians before Christians were actually called Christians. The first terminology of being named Christian was, was actually brought on by a group of people in the book of Acts that we'll see later on. But prior to that, they were followers of the way because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So they're followers of the way at this moment. That's what they were recognized as. So he's after these followers of the way, which are Christians. And he says this, as he was approaching Damascus on the mission, his light from, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, and the voice replied, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days, and he did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming and laying hands on him so that he can see Again, so we see that God shown himself to Saul, right? It, it blinded Saul, but God gave him direction. Jesus said, hey, go to Damascus, and I'm going to send someone to you. And this is Ananias. And this is Ananias' response. But, but Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers. In Jerusalem, excuse me, in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by leading priests to rest Everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, that's confirmation, he sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Amen, we're having baptize, baptism this week. Come on, somebody. Yeah, clap for that. Six people getting baptized. That's amazing. So he got baptized. We believe in that here. And, and afterwards, he ate some food and he regained his strength. The Bible says this, Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is indeed the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus followers, or excuse me, among Jesus followers in Jerusalem? They asked, and didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful, and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Let's pray for a minute. Father, God, I ask right now, Lord, that as we continue to move into this message, into the word that you've given me, Father, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, Lord, that it would not be my words, but your words. Father, that you would open our hearts to what it is that you want to speak into them tonight. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that transformation power comes over somebody tonight. God, we ask this in his precious and holy name. And everyone said, amen. So, I titled this message, this is amazing because I didn't really realize what song they were singing. But I titled this message, Total Transformation. Total Transformation. How many people like transformation stories. Anybody? Y'all like a transformation? Like, I love a good transformation story. Like, real life, I, I've probably said this before, but let's just be honest. Y'all don't listen to half of what I say, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, uh, but I love a good transformation story. So, one of my favorite things to do, and y'all are going to laugh. Y'all are going to think I'm, I'm, I'm crazy, but this is real life. Uh, this is just a little insight on your pastor. I do have emotions, okay? And I will cry. 
but typically only at one thing. And it's transformation. And there's something on YouTube <laughs> that every time <laughs> it gets me. And there have been moments that my wife has walked in, and I'm in tears, and she's like, what in the world? And I'm like, do you see this? Do you see this little girl in America's Got Talent just got the golden buzzer? <laughs> like, that, that's my transfer. Like, I, I, no joke. Like, I, America's Got Talent golden buzzer moments are like, I am like, what? Because in that moment, I don't hear me. Like, in that moment, everything changed. Like, that is, t- like, in that moment, everything they live for is like, boom, and it's just like the confetti and the gold, and I'm not going to lie, I only cry at the singers. I mean, that's just real. Um, that's because every pastor wants to secretly sing, right? Okay, so no offense to the dancers and everybody else. I don't cry when you get a golden buzzer. I love you, but it's the singers. They, they pull on my heartstrings, and then all of a sudden, when they get that, golden buzzer moment it's like just absolute transformation in that moment nothing in their life is ever going to be the same and I love that I feed off of that I really believe that's why God called me into ministry because I feed off of seeing people's lives change just like this man named Saul just like how God changed his life. I feed off of that. And the reason I feed off of it is because I was once Saul myself. I was once far away from God. I once needed a Savior just like everyone else. I was once a blasphemer of Christians. I couldn't stand the church. But then God redeemed me. He totally transformed my life. And I can sit here and honestly attest to you today that 12 years ago, God radically changed me. Anybody that knew me, when they found out I'm a pastor now, they're like, he does what? He went from throwing parties to preaching? What happened with this guy? Jesus. And that's the power that Jesus has tonight, amen? To totally transform your life. I don't believe you walked in here just because you want something small changed. I believe you walked in here because you want something transformed. You don't want just a happy little message to feel good so you can make it through Monday. You know, No, no, you want God to absolutely radically transform your life so that on Saturday you're just as filled up that when you come in on Sunday, it's just an overflow of what God's already been doing in your week. Did you follow that? I'm going to jump into my first point. Here's what I want you guys to look at tonight. First thing I want you to see is that God can change anybody. You believe that? God can change anybody. And we see this in this moment because Saul was a persecutor and a murderer of Christians. He, he would literally kill Christians. As a matter of fact, just several weeks ago, do you guys remember the message on the first Christian martyr, Stephen? We talked about him dying. Saul was the man there holding the coats as they stoned him. He was the one that authorized the killing of the first Christian martyr. And then he continued by wanting to kill all of them. Anybody that was going against his Jewish faith, he was after them. He hated Jesus. He wanted nothing to do with Jesus. To him, Jesus was a disruption. He was not the Messiah. And if you would have asked anybody, and we see it by Ananias' claims, can God change Saul, people would have been like, oh, I don't know about that. We still have people like that. See, we fall on two sides of uh, of this. Can God change anybody? And and really what we're saying is, is two things. Number one, most of us in this room, we have people that we're praying for. We have people that we want to come to Jesus. We have people in our lives that we genuinely want to see them come to know God. And they may be children of ours. They may be siblings of ours. They could be parents of ours. But at the end of the day, we see how far away from God they are. And we really question, God, can you really change anybody? Because my child is living far from you right now. God, can you really change anybody? Because my parents, they don't believe And I just don't know that they will. God, can you really change anybody? 
Because I've been praying over my brother or my sister or my mother or my fiance or my husband or whoever. I've been praying over them for so long that they would come to know you. And it hasn't happened yet. God, can you really change anybody? Well, we have a testimony of right here that absolutely God can. There's no limitations to who he can change. There's no merit of bad that you can do that God can't undo. Did you hear that? There's nothing bad enough that you can do that God can't undo with his grace. That's the power of God that we have here on this earth. That's what we can tap into. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus because we have a grace that overcomes everything that we've done against God. That's good news. I don't know about you, but y'all should be happy about that one. Because without the grace of God, all of us are destined for death. That's the promise. The second side of the fence that we fall on is not can God change them, but can God change me? I really think that that's where a lot of us tend to fall. You know, it's human nature to be selfish. And I wouldn't say that it's selfish to want to be changed, by all means. Don't, don't hear me wrong on that, but... Most of us, if we're honest, our, our focus is not on God, why aren't you changing them? Our focus is, God, why aren't you changing me? Most of our focus isn't always on, God, why aren't you helping my, my mother or my father or my sister or my brother or whoever, but God, why aren't you helping me? And, and really what happens is we begin to look at our own lives and we begin to presuppose that God cannot use us that God cannot transform us, that maybe he can do it for them, but what I've done in my life is a little too much for him to do it for me. But yet here we have a story of a man named Saul that literally killed Christians, that was literally a, you think you did some bad stuff? This guy was a murderer. He went out with the intent to kill and did so, yet God said, I have chosen him as my instrument. You know what he's saying? I can change anybody. You can see Ananias there, but God, hold on. Like, God, like, you know whose house you're sending me to? Do you know, God, like, God, this is Saul. Like, he has killed people. And God's like, I know. But I can change anybody. Like, I want to put this in modern-day terms. Let's pretend that Osama bin Laden, one of the greatest terrorists to ever live, still live today, who notoriously hated Americans and notoriously hated Christians. Let's pretend that God came to you in a dream and said, hey, this is where he's at. I need you to go pray over him. Do you believe God can change anybody? That's the, that's the weight of this situation. When he's calling upon Ananias, he's saying, Ananias, but God, are you sure this is not a trap? God, are you sure he's not going to kill me? God, are you sure? And he's saying, I can change anybody. Some of you walked in here tonight, and if you hear anything I say, you need to understand this. God can change you. He can change your family. He can change your marriage. He can change your situation. He can change everything about your life if you make yourself available. God is able, but we've got to make ourselves available. This leads me on the next point because most of the time when we struggle with this idea, can God change anyone, it's really, God, can you change us? God, can you take the desires away from me? Can you, can you take this porn addiction away from me? Can you take this sex addiction away from me? Or God, this lust away from me? Or this substance abuse away from me? God, can you remove this from me? Can you change me, God? And this is why it's because we often attribute our past failures to what God's able to do in our lives today. And so this is my point number two that I want to share with you today. is past failure isn't final. Do you hear that? Past failure isn't final. There are so many of us in this place that have failed God. Every single one of us have failed God. 
It's not a matter of if you will fail God. It's a matter of if you will continue to worship Him when you do. Did you hear that? You know how easy it is to stop worshiping God when things aren't going your way? You know how easy it is to just turn your back when, when He just seems not to be there for you? Well, then God, I just don't know what to do anymore. I'm not going to be there for you either. And see, what we do is we allow our past to dictate our present, and we allow our past to, all of a sudden, we think just because we messed up back then or we failed in the process somewhere that this is final. God's done with me. He can't use me. I've messed up too much. It's over for me now. Many of us in this room today, I can tell you right now, I feel the Spirit of God in here. I feel it on some of you. You genuinely believe that your past is stopping you from what God wants to do in your life. You really believe that your past is stopping you. You don't believe God can use you because of it. You believe it's too much. So you've chalked up your past failures as final with God. You said, God, but I did this, so I guess this is as far as I can go. You ever put limits on yourself because of what you've done? Like, this is real life uh, for me. When I was a young, uh, young in ministry, I was an idiot. I mean, can I just be real? Like, I did a lot of stupid stuff. I did not live up according to uh, the way that I should have. Uh, I was young and dumb and in ministry, which is a combination of a lot of things. So uh, let's just say that I didn't do things the way that I should have always done them. I had a lot of wisdom to grow, and I still do. Amen. Charlotte, yeah, the people that know me, praise God. But seriously, though, there was a moment in my life because I knew that I came from a drug addiction background. I knew that I'd had premarital sex. I knew that I had wasted everything that God said in the Bible was sin. I had practically done it. So I'm kind of like, okay, well, now I'm in ministry. And I've pretty much done everything in this book that tells me not to do. So therefore... You must only be able to take me this far. And you know what it was? It wasn't that God wasn't able to take me further. It was in order to take me further, I had to open up about my failures. You know why I limited God? Because I didn't want anybody to know about the failures I had in my life. And God said, if I'm going to take you there, you're going to talk about it. If I'm going to take you there, you're going to talk about the fact that you were addicted to pornography for 10 years and it took somebody to come into your life and to break those chains over you. If, you're going to, if, you're going to, if I'm going to take you there, John Michael, you cannot be afraid to share the testimony, the failures, the things that's happened in your life because I promise you it's going to free somebody one day. You better talk about that divorce that you went through. You better talk about the drugs, the addiction you had. You better talk about it. Some of you right now, you limit God because you're afraid to open up about your failures. But let me tell you something. Your failures do not define you. Your failure is nothing over your head. But I promise you this, that your failures can free somebody if you would just open your mouth. We see this right here. Paul's past was not, that wasn't it. His failures for God weren't final. God had so much more for Saul that he couldn't even imagine. And I'm not sure if I've been interchanging Saul or Paul. And if I have, I apologize. But I'm going to get there. <laughs> Y'all are like, Saul, Paul, I think he's talking about two different guys. I'll, we'll get there. But Saul wasn't final. I love what God said to Ananias. He said, no, 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 no. You've got this all wrong. <laughs> what you see is not what I see. You see a murderer, I see a future missionary. You see a murderer, I see a future minister. And Ananias, what you see is not what I see. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. This is my chosen instrument. You know, some of you, God has a call on your life. God wants to use you as an instrument of his. You say, well, I need a theology degree. No, you don't. You don't need a theology degree to tell somebody that Jesus loves them. 
You don't need a church backing you to go start a ministry. You don't need a church backing you to start going to get coffee with people and saying, hey, you know God loves you. But you know how often we wait on that? God, when are you going to put somebody in my circle to get me going? And he's like, just do it. You know what I would love to see? This, this, is, the, this is my heart for Village Church. And I, and I say this a lot, but th- this is real. My heart for Village Church is to not, a, not create a consumer culture that shows up every Sunday dependent on me to feed you something, okay? And I'm just going to be real. I, I, I'm not your parent. That's not my job. Uh, My job is to equip you for the work of the ministry. My job is to send you out, not to constantly keep you as little children feeding off of the milk in this place. Amen? That's not my job. And what happens in churches is so many times people come to the pastor and they say, Hey, pastor, we need this ministry. And it's like, awesome, go start it. Well, I didn't, I mean, I thought you were going to start it, pastor. Well, there's where we were wrong. (laughs) Well, pastor, we need this ministry. Go start it. I, boy, I just, oh my God, I can't. I don't have a degree. I mean, I don't know. I mean, do you know God changed your life? Well, yeah, I know that. Do you really like playing pickleball? Because I do. If y'all don't know, we have a pickleball group. We're starting about Jesus, real life. Sharon and, and Austin are going to be ahead of it because they're awesome. But I say that because think about this. We don't, we don't have to have a theology degree to go out and share Jesus. And I'm going to get into what Paul, or excuse me, what Saul does here. We don't have to have all, these, all, all this church backing to get out there and share Jesus. If you like to skateboard, guess what? Invite your friends to go skate and at the end of it share a five-minute message about Jesus. If you like to cook, invite your friends over. Cook. Share them a five-minute message about Jesus. I'm about to rock somebody's world. If you drink wine... Oh, God, is he saying this? Hey, invite him over for wine and share about Jesus. Y'all are like, oh, my God, did he just say that? There's nowhere in the Bible that alcohol is sin, and we believe that here at Village Church, okay? And I will defend that all the way to anywhere you want to go. So at the end of the day, we do believe drunkenness is sin. Amen? But if you want to start Bibles and beers, I'm just saying had a lot more people show up to drink a beer with me than I have had read the Bible with me. I know this is funny, but this is real. This is real. This is called thinking outside of the box and getting outside of our traditions of what we've been told church is supposed to look like, smell like, act like, be like, and we just start being the church. We stop relying on this building as a place to get fed, and we start going out and feeding people. Village Church refuses to build a culture of consumerism. We are building a culture of connection that goes out and shares the Bible with people. Now, we do not smile at sin in any way. And there's nothing that I've set up here tonight that you can justify as sin. We'll have a conversation about it if we need to. But I want to challenge you to take what you enjoy and your gifts and utilize them and realize that your past failures are not final. God can use you. He can take what you love and what you enjoy and your passions, and he can use that to bring other people to know him. I'm going to move to... My final point, because I love what Paul says here. I love how this story ends. Ananias goes to the house, and if you notice, Jesus appears, and Saul's like, oh, who is this? And he's like, why are you persecuting me? He's like, well, who are you? And he's like, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And Saul never responds. I find that very interesting, because Saul knew who Jesus was. So when Jesus appeared to him, he had no response. There was nothing he could have said. He's exactly right. I am the man that's persecuting you. And then instead of Jesus killing him right there, like many of us feel like God is just ready to cut us down, he turned everything around. He said, I'm using you. Using all your failures. Using all your hurts. Using all your pains using everything you've struggled with, and I'm using you. I'm going to send you around the world. I'm going to use you in ways you can never imagine. And you know what we see from this story? 
this is the last point, is that found people, they find people. Found people, they go find people. I just said you don't have to have a theology degree to tell people about Jesus. One of the things that I love the most about this story, now don't hear me wrong, because I know some people are like, oh, Village Church will just throw anybody up there to pray. That's not what I'm saying. I believe in discipleship, amen? We do that here. We have a connect group every other Wednesday night. Another plug, y'all should start coming, because it's awesome. We had almost 20 people there last week. It's amazing. Amen, thank you. He comes. But I love that Paul, excuse me, Saul, I'm sorry, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there. I love that Saul didn't wait on anybody to come confirm what happened in his heart because he knew. He had a real experience with God. He didn't need anybody else coming alongside him saying, hey, I know you had this experience with God, now let me tell you, you know, what you're supposed to act like, do like, be like. No, he went straight into the synagogues and began preaching and teaching. So much wisdom for the Holy Spirit came upon him that even the Pharisees and the religious leaders of that day could not stand against the wisdom that this man Saul of Tarsus had, this once persecutor of Christians, once murderer of Christians, this man that once came to this city to take Christians back in chains is now sitting there freeing these very same people from their chains from their bondage and their unbelief in God in the Messiah and the chosen one Jesus you know the most amazing part about this whole story is it doesn't end here but Saul this is where I want to wrap up Saul doesn't stay Saul forever we see later on a few chapters how many of you ever heard me talk about the Apostle Paul Anybody? Y'all heard me mention his name a few times. Every time I mention his name, I say murder, a missionary. You know, I'll let you guys know. You know, Saul is Paul. It's the same guy. What happened was later on in the Bible, because God was sending him to the Gentiles, he gave him what would be a Gentile name and took his Hebrew name, Paul, or excuse me, Saul, and he turned it to Paul. And guess what God did with this man? You know how we talk about our past, the, the, the past failures are not final? This man went on to take three missionary journeys, to share the gospel all around Asia Minor, all around Rome, started churches all throughout. He was shipwrecked more than once. There's even a time that this man had to stay on a plank in the middle of the ocean all through the night. It's right here in Acts. All for the glory of God, just so the message of Jesus would get out. This man would go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament. When you read Romans, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. When you read 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Philemon. When you read all these books, it's this man. It's this man that God used to do that. You think you're unqualified or you're unworthy? Oh, no, brother, no, sister. You are right where God wants you, and you are exactly who God wants to use. You're exactly the person he wants to use. Paul went on to be one of the greatest missionaries to ever live. You know, one of the things that I've always heard in my life is it's not how you start, but it's how you finish. Many in this room, you might not have started right, but it doesn't mean you can't finish right. You might have had a few hiccups and hurdles along the way, but it doesn't mean you can't end it. The way Paul ends it when he's on his deathbed, he's writing to Timothy, and he says, for I have finished the race. I've laid my heart out. Paul knowing that when he gets there, he's going to see Jesus and he's going to say, my child, my good and faithful servant, job well done. God wants to say that to you. God wants to say that very same thing to you. He wants to say, my child, I know you've been through hell and back. But your worship remained intact. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray, Father. God, I ask right now, Lord, in this moment that is 
the worship team begins to come, Father, I pray that your spirit would stir in our hearts tonight, God. Lord, that you would remind us of the ability you have to change anybody, God. It could be a family member, a friend, ourselves, whatever it may be. But, God, you have that power. Lord, our past failures, they're not final, God. You have so much more for us if we would just begin to speak about them and not allow those things to be our limitations. Father, and I pray that each and every person here, if they've been found by you, God, I pray that they would go out and find somebody else that needs you. God, that's what the gospel's about. Lord, let us go out and find people. Let us bring you into what we enjoy doing. Let us bring you in to our lives. Father, let us stop separating our, our, our worldly lives and our spiritual lives. But God, let us bring you into everything we do. The Bible says that no matter what we do, we do it all for the glory of God. All for Him. Whether we eat or we drink, it's all for His glory. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would spark something in somebody tonight. A dream, a vision, a passion that they've had. Something that you're telling them go and do and start in my name Father I pray that we would be a culture God that invites you into our lives not rejects you from them and only comes on Sundays to experience you Father maybe there's someone in here tonight that needs to be transformed the Bible says that Jesus stands at the door and he knocks on the hearts that his word never returns void Maybe you're in here tonight and God's talking to you. He's knocking on your heart. And if you were honest with yourself, you would say, I've never committed my life to Christ. And tonight is the night I choose to do that. Just like Saul, I choose to follow God. I choose to go from sinner to saint, from sinner to daughter to son. Tonight's the night I surrender my life to Jesus. If that's you, I just want you to say this. Father, forgive me of my sin. Tonight is the night that I'm going to follow you for all the days of my life. I put my past behind me. Lord, I look to you for my future. God, I'm going to love you. I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ today. If that's you, I just want you to lift your hand up. I want to pray with you. All over this building, if that's you, I just want to pray with you. I see you. Amen. Anybody else? I want to pray with you. I see you. I see you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I just want to invite you. I want to pray over you, Father, these people with their hands up tonight. God, I pray that whatever's causing it, Lord, the Holy Spirit moving in their life, Lord, whatever decision they're making, Father, if it's to follow you, God, we rejoice, Father. The Bible says that angels in heaven rejoice any time a human comes to know the Father. And so, Lord, we rejoice tonight for those that you're bringing from death to life. God, we rejoice for those online that you're bringing from death to life. Father, here in this church, we rejoice tonight. Amen, God. I just ask, give God a hand clap of praise tonight for everybody that made a decision. Give God a hand clap of praise. I'm telling you, he's going to do something in your life. And I want to invite you to go ahead and stand and worship with us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and have him start the track. I want you guys to hear this song. Go ahead and stand and worship with us. I want you guys to hear this because God has made us a promise. And I want you to know it's not stopping now. Amen. Amen.